Hello everyone and welcome back to the Animal Artist Collective. If you are new to the channel or new to this series, just as a very brief overview, the Animal Artist Collective was founded by myself and Jennifer Charlie to help bring awareness to animal species around the world as well as to aspiring artists. In addition to Jennifer and myself, we have Anita and Eve returning to the collective this month, as well as two new artists, Sade from Sadie Saves the Day, who most of you probably already are familiar with, as well as Valerie from Drawing with Fire. I will put links to all of their videos in the description below, so you can go ahead and take a look at them after you have watched this video. This month, we are going to be featuring animals from oceans and coasts, and we're really excited to be bringing you such a different habitat than we focused on in the last set of videos. If you haven't uh, noticed or kind of heard about what we are doing this year on AAC is all of our videos that come out every other month from here on out are going to be featured on a different habitat or biome. That way we can feature a wide variety of species. All of the artists collaborate in private conversations about the animals that we're going to be featuring so that we don't overlap and about different things that we want to talk about. So hopefully we can each bring you a different take on the theme at hand. Starting with our May theme, we are going to be letting all of you guys vote on what biomes you would like to see based on the couple that we have pre-selected uh, for the list for you to choose from. And that starts today. So you can actually head on over to our Facebook group right now. I'll put a link in the description below and you can vote on what you would like us to cover in the May video. We are all really excited in the collective to be able to interact more with you. So if you want to go ahead and be part of that social media, make sure to head on over to Facebook, but we are also on Twitter and Instagram if those are better platforms for you. So let's go ahead and wrap back around to my video and the animal that I chose is the cuttlefish. Now I flip flop back and forth literally for weeks on this. I couldn't decide what animal I wanted to do. And if you've been following me over on Instagram or saw my video on the Hanamule watercolor paper, you probably already know that. I wanted to do a seahorse or a squid or I had other animals bouncing around in my head and different things that I wanted to talk about. But I eventually just went back to my gut and Cuttlefish is the first thing that came to mind. I think they are super, super cool animals, and I was really excited to paint one for you. Cuttlefish are mollusks, and more specifically, they are cephalopods along with squid, octopuses, and nautiluses. And before you correct me on octopuses, octopuses, or octopi are fine. You can use either one, whichever you prefer. But anyway, cuttlefish have a unique internal shell, which is where they get their name from. It is called a cuttle bone, and you might already be familiar with this, especially if you've ever had birds or have friends who have birds. They often sell the cuttle bone as a source of calcium for your birdie feather friends. To the cuttlefish, the cuttle bone is actually an internal organ or structure that helps them regulate their buoyancy. It is a porous surface and they are able to change their buoyancy by changing the gas to liquid ratio inside of it. Each species of cuttlefish has its own unique shape of a cuttle bone, and I believe that I am painting a common cuttlefish here, although it's a little bit hard to say. There aren't a lot of great reference pictures. I'll talk about the process of this painting in just a little bit, but long story short is I had to piece together a lot of different images to get the pose and the colors that I wanted. Actually, let's go ahead and talk about the process for this painting right in here while I've mentioned it because this is future Denise talking to you and I got through the entire recording and uh, got so excited about talking about ocean stuff that I forgot to talk about the painting. So this is a five by seven inch painting. It's much smaller than the last piece that I worked on. This entire painting is painted with the Daniel Smith Primatech watercolors uh, with a little bit of ink at the end, but all the watercolors in it are Primatech colors. We've got fuchsite, Perperite, uh, blue appetite, I believe, sodalite, and a tiny bit of the Sleeping Beauty genuine turquoise. At the very, very end for the eyes, you'll see me put a tiny bit of one of the hematites, I believe, down in there, but uh, it's very, very minor, and I covered it up with one of the blues afterwards anyway. I really had fun painting with the Primatech watercolors. They handle a lot differently than your standard watercolors. They lift a lot easier, which sometimes can be to your benefit, but glazing can be a little bit more difficult. And because of the strong granulation, um, it's easier to let your colors muddy up uh, if you're not too careful. But I tried to be as careful as I could in these different areas and making sure that the colors stayed really harmonious. I'm working on the Hanamule Cezanne watercolor paper, which I just did that review on that I mentioned before. I really love this watercolor paper and I'm having so much fun working on it. I really hope that I can acquire more in the future so that I can continue working on this surface. 
I'm using a combination of brushes, including the Colors of Nature, the Silver Black Velvet, and the Escota Perla in the size to many of which you can find on my Amazon influencer shop, which I'll put the links of in the description below. I went through many, many, many sketches before I decided on this pose. There aren't a lot of great photographic, uh, photogenic, there we go, photogenic pictures of cuttlefish on the internet. So I was trying to find one that would work well for my aesthetic. And because the cuttlefish changed so much in color, it was really hard to decide on what pattern that I wanted to do. But I saw this one in one of the images and thought it was really pretty. So I decided on this one. I don't have a reference image to show you because it was pieced together from so many different things. But uh, if you'd like to see more on how I source my images and that kind of thing, I have lots of real-time tutorials over on Patreon and often we talk about things like that. So I think that that is about it for the process and materials that I use. So I'm gonna hand you back on over to talking about cuttlefish and the oceans. So I have always been completely fascinated by cephalopods. They are among the most intelligent invertebrates on the planet, along with their octopi cousins. And just everything about them is just so cool from their features, their structures to their behaviors as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So as you probably already know, cuttlefish are masters of camouflage, and not only can they change the color of their bodies, but they can also change the texture of their skin. What makes this even more impressive is that they actually can't detect color at all. So even though they can change colors and match to their environment for incredible camouflage, they don't see colors like we do. Instead, they perceive the polarization of light. This is something that I am not an expert in and not going to kind of try and inform you about here. I'll focus on my strengths in that regard. But what it basically means is that they are able to uh, detect contrast rather than color to help them blend in with their environments. Their eyes have these W-shaped pupils and they're insanely complicated from things like sensors in their retinas to being able to change the entire shape of the lens on the front of their eye in respect to what angle the retina is facing, which is just completely crazy that we can't do anything like that. Also, if you are familiar with vertebrates, like we have binocular vision that face forward, creating one image in front of us and we have peripheral vision, but it starts to fade away around the 180 degree mark. Uh, whereas like horses can have their eyes on the side of their head, they can see a very wide angle around them, but they still have blind spots directly in front of them and behind them. Well, cuttlefish don't have any blind spots at all because of the way that their eyes are positioned, they can actually see 360 degrees around them, which I thought was really, really cool. Cuttlefish use their immense ability to change color and texture in their environment to communicate not only with other cuttlefish, but also with other animals. But my favorite thing that I have heard about cuttlefish and their ability to camouflage and mimic other things actually has to do with their own reproductive behavior. Male cuttlefish, like most other species of animals, have to compete for breeding rights with females and um, I don't know if this is specific to certain species. I have heard it in a couple of different species, though, um, is that there are these huge large males that are often, you know, have the, the brawn, right? They have to fight and uh, one big male can often push out a lot of other males in their range for the breeding rights for a female. However, I believe that I heard in one of the nature documentaries that out of these big males that win the breeding rights to females among the other males, they still have about a 70% rejection rate with the females. But then you also have the really small males in this group, and they have actually taken to this amazingly cool behavior where they will actually change their coloration to match that of the females during the breeding season. They tuck in their arms. Uh, I think that the female cuttlefish have less arms than the males do, and they will actually glide by the bigger males undetected because the bigger males think that they're females. They'll sneak in past the larger males and then try and breed with the females, and their rejection rate is only about 30%. So it seems like in these certain groups of cuttlefish that the females are actually preferring cleverness and and resourcefulness over the big strength of the larger males, which I thought was really, really cool. So depending on the species of cuttlefish, they may have a number of different displays, but they're usually around several dozen. And these are achieved by three different types of cells that they have in their bodies. 
The one that is most superficial or closest to the top of the skin and probably the most easy to understand are their chromatophores, which are little sacs um, that can range anywhere from literally 0.1 millimeters to 1.5 millimeters in diameter, depending on the muscle traction that attaches to them. Um, but they can contain hundreds of thousands of pigment granules. And depending on the way that the muscles interact with the chromatophore by expanding it or contracting it, it'll show a different amount of color and a different um, arrangement of colors. When the chromatophores contract, they reveal two other types of cells called the iridophores and the lucifores. I think that's how you say it, although it sounds really similar to Lucifer. We'll just try and breeze past that. Uh, but anyway, when those cells are revealed, they allow the cuttlefish to use a different type of light called structural coloration. Structural coloration can be seen in other animals like butterfly wings or peacock feathers. And in the case of the peacock, it's that the peacock feather is actually a brown feather, but because of the way that it reflects light, it appears uh, blue, teal, and green, as well as the brown. The iridophores are the structures that produce the iridescent colors in a metallic sheen with the cuttlefish, and they have these crazy displays that can like flash colors and also polarize light, which other animals can perceive in the water. The lucifores, on the other hand, are very similar to the iridophores, but they um, are specifically responsible for the white banding or spots that you see on these cuttlefish. You'll see these later in the video in this very painting because there are going to be bands of white and of darker colors. Um, but basically in the wild, these would be used to um, help them to color match in backgrounds by producing the light areas of the backgrounds that they're trying to reproduce. Cuttlefish are carnivores and they eat primarily crabs and fish so they can also eat other invertebrates like shrimp or other cuttlefish. They change their camouflage to kind of sneak up on their prey and uh, when they get close enough, they will actually like lash out with these two of their kind of hidden arms. They're called feeding tentacles to grab onto the prey and bring them to their mouth parts. If prey is being particularly difficult to capture or acquire, they can also do this really awesome hypnotic thing where they posture their bodies in a certain way and they pulse colors through them rapidly and it kind of looks like this flowing fluctuating hypnotic effect and the prey gets effectively like stunned and doesn't move and just watches them and waits to be eaten. Although cuttlefish are very good at hunting their own prey, they are prey for many, many, many other animals in the oceans. Basically, any animal that eats other animals in the ocean can eat a cuttlefish, especially when they are very, very young and small. When the cuttlefish perceives threat or is under duress, it can ink like a squid or octopus would. However, their pigment is very unique, and it's actually what we owe thanks to for our original sepia pigments. Back in the Greco-Roman time, they really valued the cuttlefish ink for this unique brown pigment that they got, although today you don't really find uh, true sepia ink anymore. It is made from other pigments and other colors. But I thought that was a really fun fact to throw in here for the AAC video, just a little tie into our watercolor adventures. So wrapping up our discussion on how cool cuttlefish are and moving into why I chose them for this video, when I was trying to decide what animals to do for this video, I had a hard time because there are so, so many issues that surround our oceans and conservation right now that I would like to shed light on. There are issues with pollution, with ocean acidification, with coral bleaching, and all of them are really, really tragic and really hard for most people to take in, including myself. It is really hard to stomach all of these things that happen with our environment and things that are going to keep happening if we don't do anything about it. So instead of focusing on a specific endangered species or one of these really, really heavy, hard-hitting topics, I wanted to go ahead and pull back a little bit and I wanted to tap into that zoo educator in me. If there's only one thing that I could choose that I am grateful about my time spent as a zoo educator, it would be that it taught me so much about how to have a conversation with people who might not share the same beliefs that I do or about the same stances on conservation and really connect with them and figure out ways to convey the information and knowledge in my head with them based on their lives. We're gonna dial it back and we're gonna focus on positivity and about the little tiny things that you can do in your life to make an impact for the situation that we are finding ourselves in today. 
Most of you guys have heard a lot of the basic party line things that we can do to help the environment in general. We know that we're supposed to turn off light switches when we leave a room. We know that we're supposed to turn off the water when we're brushing our teeth, not to leave the car running for too long, to walk, bike, and take public transportation where we can, to use less plastic in our daily lives, use reusable bags at the grocery stores. We've heard all of these things before, so I wanna talk about a couple that you might not be thinking about on a regular basis that are still really, really easy to implement in your life. The first thing I wanna talk about is in general, being an informed consumer. We talked a little bit about this during the vegan watercolor video where I specifically, me personally, I talked about that it's not as important for me not to use animal products, but it's important to me that where they're coming from are sustainable and ethical. And that applies to my life in general and all of the advice that I prefer to give when I'm having these conversations. And when I talk about sustainability, the obvious choice is that I'm talking about the sustainability of it for our environment, but it also has to be sustainable for you. It has to be doable in your everyday life. If I tell you that, oh, we're doing this ocean theme video and I want everyone to go out to their local ocean or stream and pick up garbage every single weekend for the rest of their lives, that's really hard. And it's something that is time consuming and takes away from your life and it's not taken into your considerations of planning and things that you have commitments going on. But if we talk about some of these other things, it's going to make it easier for us to do those things on a daily basis if we already have the information in our heads about little tiny things that we can do. So we're going to start off with my absolute favorite ocean-centric consumer-based uh, conservation efforts, and that is the Seafood Watch by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They set up this system a while ago. I have more information on a video. It's either the Winter Skate or the Sea Turtle and My Endangered Species series where I talk more about this, but it's really simple. It's a website or an app on your phone that when you're at the grocery store, you can, or before you go to the grocery store and you're making your list, you can literally type in the name of a fish or a type of seafood, and it will give you the options for that animal. So shrimp is a really big one. I love shrimp, it's delicious, but a lot of it is really, really awful for the environment. So when I'm at the store, I can grab a bag of shrimp, I can look to see where it was farmed or captured or wherever, I can look that up on the app and it tells me right then and there, they have three categories, if it's a best choice, a good alternative, or something to avoid. And that makes it really easy for me to by one product over another. The next thing has to do with consumerism, but it's not something that we might face on a daily basis, but maybe while you're traveling to somewhere tropical or even in our lives as crafters, I know a lot of crafters come across this often, and that is to avoid products that directly harm or exploit sea creatures and wildlife in the oceans. That can be anything from coral, um, coral jewelry, any large seashells typically came from an animal that was large and had to be you know, killed during its sexual peak or whatever when it's producing things. So things like that can be really detrimental to the environment and it's best to try and stay away from them if you can. You can also avoid anything with shark products, whether that's shark teeth or shark meat, shark fin soup, all those types of things. Sharks are an incredibly sensitive, delicate population of animals, and um, I know there's a lot of efforts being done to help them, as well as anything, this is very less common these days, but any type of turtle shell, whatever, usually when you're traveling, you might come across something like that. So just be aware of the animals that you're purchasing when you're traveling or for crafts, um, and that can really make a big impact as well by not supporting that industry. The next thing that I'm sure a lot of us can relate to, and I have to admit that I didn't think a whole lot about it before I was researching for this video, because it literally never came up in a discussion anywhere, but I think it's such a great thing to be mindful of, is that even if you don't eat seafood, a lot of us have pets that do, specifically cats, if we have salmon or tuna or whatever flavor their food is, that came from somewhere. And so it's a lot harder to check on those products. And I know that there's a lot of pets with allergies and they have to eat certain types of food and all that type of thing. But being aware of that can also be very, very helpful um, as well. I don't think that there's anything in the Seafood Watch program about that, but maybe if you know that, like for instance, tuna are a really sensitive population right now, maybe choosing salmon over tuna or something of that nature. The last one is really hard because not everyone is in a position to be able to make donations, but by making donations to organizations and foundations that are directly out in the field doing conservation work and working to save endangered species and endangered habitats and sensitive ecosystems, they're the ones that need our help the most. 
One of the reasons that we founded the AAC was so that we could better help contribute to that. I can only speak for myself, but I know as an artist on a very, very low income that I'm not able to make the contributions that I would like to to these organizations. But by creating these art pieces, by sharing the information with you, and then by hopefully someone buying one of these art pieces and donating the proceeds to a foundation organization, we can help make a difference together. So if you are in a position to do so, I've listed several organizations down below since my video is more of this general catch-all. I've listed a couple of them for you so that you can kind of pick what speaks to your heart if you want to make a direct contribution. Or if you would like to purchase this painting from this video of this adorable little cuttlefish, you can find him in my Etsy shop. And instead of picking an organization myself, I'm actually going to list them in the Etsy description as well. And I want you to tell me which one you want me to donate to. So you're gonna get to pick if you buy this piece of artwork. I'm also going to be putting up two of the pieces from my Hanamula video, the seahorse and the squid, and the same deal works for them. 50% of the proceeds will be donated to the organization of your choice from the ones listed in the description to help global conservation efforts for our oceans. I really, really hope that this video was helpful in some way to either just learn about really awesome cuttlefish or maybe you picked up one or two things about things that you can do in your daily life. Uh, maybe share it with a friend if nothing else, just so that the word gets out there a little bit more. Be sure to check out the other artist video within the Animal Artist Collective and definitely check out the hashtag on our social media, um, the hashtag Animal Artist Collective. Other artists are out there creating artwork uh, and sharing that as well. So make sure to go ahead and support them too. Don't forget to head on over to Facebook where you can vote on our theme for our May videos. There's two months between now and then. And if you wanna follow us on those social media platforms, we're gonna be sharing other things in the interim between um, efforts that we might be working on or you know, little pet features or little fun things here or there. So if you wanna go ahead and stay in touch with the artists in this collective, be sure to go ahead and give us a follow on one of those platforms. So if you are still watching this video, I wanna thank you so much for your time and for your trust in me to give you this information here. I hope that it wasn't too heavy and that we were able to mix in enough positivity because that's what I really want you to take away from this video, so stay positive, to stay hopeful, and to make really small changes in your life. So if you learned something new, I want you to let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, please give it a nice big thumbs up so we can get more awareness out there. And as always, thank you so much for your support. Thank you for my patrons who help keep this channel afloat and to each and every one of you who are doing your part to help make a difference in this world. Until next time, happy painting.